everything. So we, we, we are pretty much there now. We are in the final settings and we are at the beginning of the events of that fateful weekend. And by far, uh, Matthew 26 begins um, to tell us, firstly, the climax of the life and ministry of Jesus. This is what it has all been about from the beginning. And we, we are finally there. Secondly, um, we are at the climax of everything that the Bible is about from the beginning of the book of Genesis. This is what it was always about. See, the, the crucifixion of Jesus, we have to understand it very well. It was not just the, the, the point where his ministry on earth comes to an end. But his crucifixion and the resurrection are the point at which the whole history of the universe was going. All life in this world and in unknown worlds geared up to this specific weekend. This weekend of the crucifixion would determine the future and i dare say not only of our planet but the whole universe what is at stake is very much at the center of what is at stake is the sovereignty of god and the legitimacy of his government which now rests here on Jesus. And this helps us then understand why Isaiah said to us when prophesying about Jesus, the government of God shall be upon his shoulders. He did not just mean it majestically, but he also literally meant that on Jesus would hang the very existence of the government of God. That if Jesus is not successful at the cross, if there is no resurrection for Jesus, then there's no resurrection for us. And it would then spin a whole lot of things into confusion. In fact, if Jesus did not resurrect, I can safely tell you that I would not be a pastor. There would be no point. Everything we are doing, we are doing because of the hope of the resurrection. If everything was going to remain like this and there would be no resurrection, there would be no point to faith at all. The whole objective of faith is the fact that faith will produce one day a better world than the world we've come to know. If everything in the world was to remain as is, without that final point, there would be no purpose to any of it. All of it has a destination. And the resurrection of Jesus was going to tell us whether the destination is possible or not. It's so this particular period is a very crucial period for us in our faith and what it then meant afterwards for the future of the whole universe. The events that are here recorded, they begin somewhere around 
Wednesday afternoon. On Wednesday, Jesus asks his disciples to go and prepare a place where they are going to have their Passover celebration. By that time, the Passover celebrations have already started, but they are not yet at their climax because the Jews take seven days in their Passover. With the first two or three days mostly dedicated to prayer and cleansing, and then everything changes Thursday night, uh, crossing over into Friday, um, early morning, the whole of uh, Friday into Saturday, the Sabbath. That for them is when things then change because that is when how they uh, 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 prepare to mimic the journey out of Egypt where they now eat the roasted lamb, the unleavened bread. They eat in a squatting posture as a symbol that they are not relaxed, they are not comfortable, they are anxious to leave. And so Matthew then from chapter 26 lays out the events of that weekend for us. He tells us that it began with a meeting in the palace of Caiaphas, who was the high priest. In that meeting, the death of Jesus has been plotted and completed. Their only problem now is the issue of timing. They don't want to do it in a way that causes commotion. They don't want to do it and it coincides with the evening of the eating of the roasted lamb. They want that to pass and then crucify him. Which is why then they decided that Jesus would be crucified on the day of preparation, the Friday. Because Thursday evening would have been the evening of the Passover meal. With that gone, they could now proceed with his a, 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 a killing. And of course, we must then separate two things. Why was Jesus killed? And why did Jesus died. The two questions may sound similar, but they are not. And their answers are also quite different. Why was Jesus killed? This is a legal question. What was he charged with that produced a death penalty verdict. That is the issue. Why was he killed? Legally speaking, what, was the, 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 what were the charges on the charge sheet that was brought before the Tetrach and governor um, of uh, Judea, Pontius Pilatus? And the reasons, the legal reasons why Jesus was killed, they are found in the book of John chapter 5, verse 18. John chapter 5, verse 18, and it says, Therefore the Jews sought all the more to kill him. Why? Because he not only broke 
the Sabbath, but he also said that he, uh, that God was his father, making himself equal with God. This is one of the verses that is ignored by people who say Jesus is not God. He is the son. The Jews say, we want to kill him for two reasons. One, he claimed he, he broke the Sabbath. Two, li listen to the Jews. You, you've got to love it when people who understand what is happening show you where you are missing it. Because we think like Westerners, we've got Western influence, Western theology, where a son and a father are two different things, not in Judaism. That is why they say, but also he said that God was his father. What's wrong with that? Well, according to Judaism, making himself equal with God. Don't read this based on being influenced by reading Christian books written by Americans and the British and the Germans. They are Western theologians. Their concept of family is not similar to the Middle Eastern concept. I know we are not talking about the nature of Jesus today, but it's something that I will not skip. If you read the Bible, in the Hebrew culture, a son does not exist until the father dies. In Hebrew, all sons are the extension of their fathers. They are not alive. The father lives in them. You will see this, for example, when you go to the Old Testament. Why did Abraham choose a wife for Isaac? Why didn't Isaac do it? Why did Abraham specify where the woman will come from, which family? He's very specific. Go to my people from my own family. Go to my relatives. There you will find the wife for Isaac. And when um, Aliaza, the steward of Abraham, returned, with Rebecca. When Isaac saw Rebecca, why didn't Isaac say, but I didn't choose this woman? Why did Isaac love her? Because in the Hebrew culture, he does not exist. If she pleases Abraham, she pleases him. Why is it that when the brothers of, jo of Joseph told Jacob that they found the coat of many colors full of blood, when Jacob cried, he did not say, oh, my son is dead. He says, you have killed me. Because in the Hebrew, sons don't exist. They are the extension of their fathers. Why is it that in Hebrew, your surname is actually your father's name? Similar to here in Africa. We Africans and the people of the Middle East, we don't understand surnames as is done in the West, where in the West, a surname is a, a family name representing a whole clan. If you are Smith, you are Smith. 
or if you are darkless, you are darkless, and you are only tracing it to the first person who was called darkless. In Africa, for example, what is my surname? Most of you who know me or who read my name on the screen would say my surname is Mazibuko. But Africans would know you are wrong. My surname is not Mazibuko. My surname is so long, you cannot write it in any of the forms that we have. I'm not a Mazibugo. Mazibugo is a small part of it. I am Mazibugo. I am Konjo, Mkapamafu, Manze Zulu. And I could go on till it fills two or three pages. Because in Africa, your surname is actually a lineage of the names of your ancestors. When Westerners came to Africa, it was a foreign concept. It wouldn't tally with their idea of an identity document where there must be one name or two names and a surname. So the rest of who we are was chucked aside as clan names, but they are not clan names. They are your surname. Because in our cultures, a surname is built by every other name of a forefather. We are similar to the Hebrews. Why is it that when God would speak to the Israelites, he did not refer to one name? He would always say, I am the God of Jacob, the God of Isaac, the God of Abraham. Why did he do that? Because in every generation, the fathers live. Because in their understanding, sons are merely extensions of fathers. So when we tell a son what is his name, we count all the names of his forefathers in order to remind him he is not him. He is every other man that came before him. Because of that, when Jesus said he is the son of God, they knew what he meant. He meant he is God. Why? Because a son does not exist. A son is the extension of a father. If he is the son of God, then he is God. Always important to study the culture in order to understand the issues that influence the theology. So today we've got a lot of debates about, but Jesus uh, was just the son of God. He, he is not God. Read the people who lived with him. Why would he call himself the son of God, but they crucify him for claiming to be God? It's because they understood the language he was using. They knew exactly what he meant. See, when reading the scriptures, and this is just a, a, a point I want to throw in there for your own Bible study. Reading the scriptures has a process that the Holy Spirit leads you through. Firstly, hear the words as spoken and heard by those who were living at the time. Then transport the words to where you are today. But if you don't know what it meant to the original listeners, you will make an out-of-context application in your lifetime. All right? So you have people like the Jehovah's Witnesses saying, no, John 3.16 is clear, begotten. 
For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten. So begotten meaning the son has been made. No. It's because you are reading with an English mindset. You are not listening to Jesus as a Hebrew. If you listen to him as a Hebrew, you will know why they crucified him. Because the Hebrews knew very well that he is claiming to be God. Because they understood themselves that they were not alive. Their fathers were alive in them. Because in the Hebrew culture, just like in the African culture, I am merely an extension of my forefathers. And my duty is to make my contribution and die. Then I, together with my forefathers, will be alive in my sons. So we don't die. Don't listen to me from your Adventist state of the dead ears. Listen to me from a theology of identity. Africans and people of the Middle East, we don't die. We will die the day humanity is wiped out. We live in the next generation. That is why our names are added into the clan names. Because we didn't die. We live. When our children speak of who they are, our names will be included when they recite their surnames. Just like I will have to include it when I do my clan names. I am not just the son of those people far away. It begins with my father. I have to start from him and then his father and then his father and his father and his father. And as I build up the clan names, I am showing that I am not merely an individual. I am a collection of generations that live in me. And the Hebrews are exactly like that. Hence, they understood very well what Jesus was saying. Now, it's a very difficult concept for, for, for someone else to understand unless you have experienced it and you've lived through it. For example, you, yes, many of us may be Africans here, but we may be so influenced by Westernization, you are not clued up to what I am talking about. You know, there's a disconnection between your African heritage and the Western influences that are behind your education, your career, um, your lifestyle, and, and things like that. So just because someone may be African, it doesn't mean they understand what I am explaining. But this is something that is very critical when you approach the identity of Jesus, because you've got to listen to him and listen to the Pharisees and the high priests from their, their language and culture. That will tell you why they knew that he was claiming to be God. Because a son doesn't exist, he's an extension of a father. And if he says he is the son of God, then he is the extension of God. He is the visible side of God. He is the earthly present side of God. And that is why they crucified him. Because according to their laws, now this is where things uh, take a bit of a legal shape. When the Romans would take over any government around the world, the Romans would come and colonize you. After they colonize you, what the Romans would do, they would allow you to run your religious laws, your cultural laws. But political and administrative and criminal and civil law would be Roman law. You had no choice there. As a result, in Judaism, there are crimes that deserve the death penalty. Religious crimes, like breaking the Sabbath, like claiming to be equal with God, also known as blasphemy. However, the challenge is, under Roman law, 
only the Roman government can sanction a death penalty. So, how then they would work is that the Sanhedrin, which is the highest court of the Jewish uh, legal system, would pass a death penalty if a person has been charged and found guilty like Jesus. However, they had no authority to carry it out. The only ones who could carry out a death penalty, it was the Roman state. It had the administrative jurisdiction over capital punishment. That is why after they had concluded their trial and they sent him to Herod to verify their verdict, they still couldn't crucify him. They then had to take him to Pontius Pilatus because only the governor of Rome, who is the embodiment of Roman law, could actually administer the death penalty. Questions have been asked in history, who killed Jesus? Was it the Jews or the Romans? And the answer is very simple. It's like who killed a, a person between the gun and the one who pulled the trigger? The Romans were merely a gun, but the trigger was pulled by the Jews. They wanted him dead. They found him guilty for a capital offense. They just followed procedure to get the Romans to sanction that decision. So they meet in this house to plot uh, the, 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 the death of Jesus. The priest Caiaphas, high priest Caiaphas, is the one leading this uh, a, 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 a process. Look, this is scary. I don't care how many times you read this story. This is scary. To find people who pray five times a day plotting a murder. And why plotting it? They didn't stop praying. They were praying before. They were praying after. After they concluded the plotting of this murder, they still went to the temple to continue with the religious services and call upon the name of the Lord. It's scary how these guys were comfortable at planning assassinations and murders and still be very comfortable at the same time to do God's work like nothing happened. And it is my deepest prayer and hope that may I and all of us never be so comfortable with sin. I'm not saying if you've done something, run away from God and hide. Absolutely not. I am saying May we be filled with such shame for a sinful life that we quickly run to Jesus for confession, for forgiveness and repentance, so that when the time comes to serve him again, we have cleared our slate and have reconciled. It's very dangerous to be so used to evil and yet be so used to serving God that the two no longer affect you you can mix them and like there's no difference for these guys there was no difference plan a murder finish a murder go to the temple and administer sacrifices receive prayers call upon the name of the lord lead worship just that easily walk out of the temple back into your 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 teams they give you feedback how far are we with the the plan to kill Jesus. Where are we trapping him? Where are we arresting him? It is, it is a very scary sense of normality. It's scary. It is really scary. You know, it's, it's things that you hear uh, uh, only, you know, whispered in corners where you hear about us pastors who are having extramarital affairs, you know, pastors who would sleep with their girlfriends uh, 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 on a Friday and on a Sabbath morning we are preaching. It's scary for me. It's really scary. The level of boldness in, in mixing the two, like nothing happened. It, it's a bit, it's horrific. It, it causes one to shiver, to think that 
as human beings, we've developed such a level of comfortability with mixing good and evil. And like I'm saying, I'm not saying people should run away, but you know, one, I suppose maybe some of us are still old school. We've got that thing that if I'm not yet spiritually right with God, I create a bit of space between me and serving him. It's not because the distance cleanses me. It's a symbol of humility. It's a symbol of humbling ourselves before our God. It's a symbol of confession and repentance, reconciliation and bringing yourself back to God before you can continue administering his things. But these guys were not there. They could plan a murder. And in the same meeting, move on to agenda item number two. Remember for these guys, Passover was a massive thing. It took a lot of planning to prepare Jerusalem for the Passover. It's like the Muslims and the Hajj, all right? Uh, when they go for the Hajj, um, 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 every, every year, it's a huge effort to bring all that together. It's similar to in India. Um, I think it's known as the festival of light when everyone who can gathers around the Ganji river, uh, which is the holiest site um, in India. You know, those things are not small. Governments spend hundreds of millions of dollars planning security routes to avoid stampedes and, and, and placing hospitals and ambulances and all sorts of things and counter-terrorism teams. Those things are not small, they are huge. And so during Passover, the highest leading parliament court of the Israelites, the Sanhedrin, has to meet regularly to, to still talk about Passover. Are things still going well? Are there enough animals coming into the city for the sacrifice, sacrifices? Um, Accommodation-wise, how are things going? Are people being accommodated? Are there enough inns? Are there enough hotels? All of that. But of course, the reports that need to be filed with the Roman government, because remember, there were freedom fighters opposing the Roman government. And the Roman government on, on times like Passover was always on edge because Passover reminds the Roman, the, the Israelites of their liberation. So that's the time even politically it is tense. That's the time when the political freedom fighters are calling for the overthrow of the Roman government. They are inspired by the, the, the liberation from Egypt. So even the Romans are keeping a very strict eye. They need to know who's who, who's coming into the city, who's leaving. The intelligence reports. So here you have the Sanhedrin easily plotting murders, administrating the Passover, and also at the same time leading in worship like nothing has gone wrong. And the point I'm making about the first part of this story is I pray that God may instill in you and me a sense of respecting him and honoring him. May it never come easy and normally to me or to you to plunge into sin and then plunge into God's offices. Like I said, by no means have I suggested that the distance will cleanse us and make us holy. But I'm simply saying, there is a level of honoring and respecting God, where while you are reconciling with him, confessing your sin, some things just need you to take a step back and say, you, you know what, Lord, I did not only mess you up, but I messed myself up, and I'm not okay. I, I need to spend time working with you to bring me back. So I'm just going to pause a bit from any of these offices where I am needed, just so I could reconnect with you.
But these guys were different. Same table, plan a murder, plan a Passover, same conversation. It was doable. And so Jesus is now close. Remember, he had entered Jerusalem triumphantly on the donkey. Then he left the city again to the, uh, 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 this uh, village close to Jerusalem called Bethany. That is where this woman whose name is not given then comes and anoints him with this expensive oil. I've raised this to you before that there has been a historical challenge with this. There are three women. I'll just use it as a reminder because I've discussed it before. There are three women that are often confused for one woman. There is a woman called Mary of Magdala. There is a woman who is Mary, the sister of Lazarus and Martha. Then there is this woman here who came and anointed Simon uh, in the house of Simon the leper and anointed Jesus' feet. In the writings of Seventh-day Adventist theologians and early founders, and together with the writings of many, many, many other founders of other churches, these three women have been assumed to be one. Then Mary Magdalene, who had a Jesus deliver her from seven spirits. That that woman was also Mary, the sister of Lazarus and Martha. And that that same woman is the one that anointed Jesus' feet here. And that that same woman is the one that was caught in adultery. This is a common understanding of many Christians that this is one woman. Where does this come from? In September 15, nine, and the year was 15, 1992. That is where it comes from. In a sermon preached by Pope Clement. And I've put that sermon before on my uh, ministry page exactly to clarify this. In that sermon, Pope Clement says, the woman caught in adultery from whom Jesus took out the demons of hollow tree is this woman also who anointed Jesus' feet. Historically, even the Bible had never suggested that all these women are one woman. It had not there was absolutely no evidence that these women were one until the year 1591 September when Pope Clement preached that sermon. From there, it was accepted as gospel truth that this is one woman. What we do know It does appear that Mary, Mary Magdalene, we know Jesus had delivered her from seven demons. She came from a town called Magdala, which is why she's called Mary Magdalene which poses problems when the Bible tells us the hometown 
of Lazarus, Martha, and their sister Mary, because they were not from Magdala. Then there are the two other women whose names are not even mentioned. The anointer and the one caught in adultery. Okay? So biblically speaking, strictly biblically speaking, I by no means am suggesting that those who say it's one woman are wrong. I'm merely saying, whatever evidence they have, it's not in the scripture. And we can only trace it to Pope Clement. No one had ever written about these women being one. So it has always posed a difficulty. I know that even Ellen G. White tried to resolve this matter of the Marys. And again, I suppose then it will boil down to faith. You know, if you accept that what she is saying is a revelation from God, then you will find a way to reconcile the Marys. But so far as the scripture itself speaks about these women, we don't have anything to connect them into one. We may to some degree narrow them down into three. That there was a woman caught in adultery, that there was Mary Magdalene, who possibly was the anointer here, in this story, or that the third one, there was also Mary, the sister of Lazarus. Now I'll share with you why some scholars have suggested, if at all, if there is reconciliation of the Marys that could be done, it would be the lady that anointed Jesus and Mary Magdalene. The reason being, later on, in the book of Luke and in the book of Acts, we are told that Mary Magdalene was one of the women who was very much a, a, a sponsor or a financial supporter of the ministry of Jesus Christ. We now know that, but we don't only stop there. Thanks to archaeology, we also have this document called the Gospel of Mary Magdalene. And now that that document has been translated, it has told us more. It has told us that this Mary from whom Jesus took out seven demons became a woman who ran a very successful fishing business. She was a successful fisher woman. She appears to have owned boats that were used by fishermen. This is not in the Bible. It's now coming from an extra biblical source. And so scholars have always said, if there is anyone who could have afforded such an expensive perfume and was this dedicated to Jesus and his ministry, it most likely would be that this unnamed woman is Mary Magdalene. But the scripture itself, has never given us any conclusive thing to say definitely this is one woman or two women or three women. For now, we just know four different stories uh, that have these women called Marys, okay? Other than, of course, Mary, the mother of Jesus, whom the Bible is always clear about. But there are these four Marys, a sister of Lazarus, a one called Mary a Magdalene, from whom Jesus took out seven demons, a woman who anointed Jesus, whose name is not given, and a woman caught in adultery, whose name is not given as well. The only evidence that we have where they were put into one came as late as 1591. That was the first time that the whole world heard that these women are one. Again, I'm going to clarify for you so that you never get lost. 
by no means am I suggesting that those who say it's one woman are wrong. I am saying that conclusion can only be made by relying on sources outside the Bible. The Bible itself has not conclusively provided any evidence which allows us to narrow these women into one. That's what I'm saying. So if you believe they are one because you have read certain books or documents written by certain individuals, that's fine, really. Um, you know, it's neither here nor there. It has no role absolutely whatsoever on whether you and I will make it to heaven or not. It's just an interesting point of biblical study. So depending on what source material you would want to rely on, you may want to believe that Mary Magdalene married the sister of Lazarus, uh, the woman who anointed Jesus, the woman caught in adultery. They are all one. No problem there. You may think, no, it's just two women fine, no problem, or four women, no problem. I was just highlighting a, 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 an issue of biblical characters that comes with this anointing, that there's always been a debate about who's this woman, where did she come from, um, this, this uh, woman that Matthew does not name, okay? Um, so this woman comes, this woman uh, 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 anoints Jesus, the disciples mama, they say, look, this is such an expensive perfume, it could have been used in order to feed the poor, the hungry, the homeless and Jesus says, listen the poor will always be among you those are very painful words to hear because we always pray for the end of poverty and if Jesus says the poor will always be among you I suspect that's a very sad confirmation that poverty will not end but it's not a confirmation that God will not end it in your life. It simply means even as God finishes it in our lives or in, in, in the lives of many others, there are many others who are making decisions that rebuild poverty. Remember, poverty is not always a construct of society. Poverty is not always produced by capitalism or, or capitalist systems. Sometimes poverty is an individual choice. Some people are given all the opportunities to get out of poverty, but they simply reject those opportunities. Some people are born in affluence, are born in prosperity, but as soon as the parents and the grandparents die, they squander all of it into nothing. And then the next generation born from them is born poor. So sometimes, even if God ends poverty in one generation, it does not guarantee that the generation that will follow will be as diligent as those that God used to end poverty. As Solomon said it, you may be a diligent, hardworking person, but who knows whether you have given birth to foolish sons and daughters who upon your death will squander your wealth and will reduce all your achievements to nothing. So, when Jesus said poverty shall always be with you, he was not suggesting stop praying about poverty because it will never end. He was merely saying, as long as you are in this world, you will always find your way into poverty because not everyone is as committed to a life of prosperity, excellence, hard work, and quality. Some people just have it in them to destroy whatever opportunities they are given. And thus, poverty will always be available from one generation to another. And when she anoints him, Jesus, however, that is where we are more interested, is that Jesus then says, this is the anointing for me because I am about to be buried. Interestingly, people are anointed when they are dead. The Egyptians are the oldest civilization known in the world that used perfumes and spices on a body once a pharaoh had died or a noble person had died in preparation to mummify them. So other cultures like the Israelites, why did the Israelites do it? Because in Israel, a burial has two parts. In Israel, when you die, 
they don't immediately take you to the ground. No. In Israel, the dead are initially buried in graves that are dug in mountains and hills and canyons. That's where the dead are initially buried and the rocks are used to close there like they did with Jesus. All right? When a year has passed, they would have a second ceremony where they would now collect the bones, put them on a clay box, which is known as the ossuary. It was a small box, not as big as the Western coffin, a, a small box, because they were not going to lay the bones like a, 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 a living human being. They just piled them on, on each other, the feet bones and everything, the skull on top, then they close the ossuary, then they bury the ossuary on the ground. So there are two parts to it. So to make sure that the dead don't smell, their bodies are treated with perfumes for a couple of days after death. Okay, this causes the body to dry rather than to rot and melt and produce fluids and then it starts smelling. So the, 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 the spices they used, it was ancient recipes included in there were salt and there was calamine and there was aloe. Many researchers have tried to find the exact combination used by the Israelites and the, by the Egyptians and it's been quite difficult to really come up with the specific recipe. They used these recipes. They kept embalming the body. And in the process, the body would rot, would smell, but not in a way like it would have smelled. Can you imagine a mountain full of dead bodies? The smell would be really a stench that covers the whole city. But there was no stench. Though the bodies would smell, but there was no stench because of these herbs and spices and oils. But Jesus was not yet dead. Yet she came and she anointed his feet. And Jesus says, don't bother her. She is preparing me for my burial. One of the interesting things is that, generally speaking, such treatment was done for the bodies of very, very rich people, typically royalty. It wasn't generally done for just about anyone. It was done for royalty. And perhaps in a way, this woman symbolically and prophetically identifies Jesus as someone who is no mere human being, if one can put it that way. The disciples are offended by the price that it could have been sold in order to feed the poor. Hence, I was saying, Jesus says, look, the poor will always be around you. You will have all the time you need to take care of the poor. But this has to be done because I am going to die. She is anointing me because I am going to die. So, of course, that's where the challenge is. Were they really complaining because they love the poor? Or was this really a money issue? Um, I have read quite beautifully uh, 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 an analysis of this story from many, including Ellen G. White and others. And there is, seems to be con consensus that really this was not a complaint because they loved the poor. This was a complaint because the money, the money was the issue. They wanted that money in their purse. And they didn't understand why this woman was wasting this money. Now, let me just explain something very important about that. Though we don't know this woman's identity by name, we know beyond reasonable doubt, based on her actions, that she is someone whose life had been touched by Jesus in an irreversible way. And in my life, I've had the most humbling pleasure to meet people who devote hundreds and thousands of rands every year on church projects. 
without anyone asking them, without them paying back, being paid back. And when you ask why, why this dedication of so much money into church programs, and you know what you always get, you hear a powerful, beautiful story about where Jesus came through for me. All of the people I have met who have done this have all of them told me life-changing stories about where Christ came through for them. And because of that, they made a vow that they would never spare anything for the kingdom. I wonder if we all have that. I have my own personal story. One that has kept me in the ministry in good or in bad. It's a story that says, because I know what you did for me, Jesus, nothing in this world would be enough to suggest to me that serving you is not worth it. We all have an alabaster box that we need to break and open. But you see, no one breaks their alabaster box until Christ breaks you first. You have to have your own experience with Jesus. It is that experience that will immediately lead you and me and all of us to say to Jesus, what do you want from me? I will give it all to you. I will break any alabaster box in which there is any expensive perfume for you because of what you, Jesus, have done for me. And again, I'm going to challenge all of us and say, sometimes we expect people to go all out for God not understanding that they don't have a story to tell yet. I've always believed, maybe wrongly, but I've always believed when you finally understand where Jesus found you, no one will ever again ask you to do anything for Jesus. It will come on its own as a raging fire. Every time you remember where Jesus found you. And sometimes I think honestly, we are busy pestering, bothering people to serve the Lord when we have not paused to just say, do you have a story with the Lord? Because if you've got a story, you don't get to ask for permission. You see, your story with Jesus is what makes you serve God even when you are not in the church board. Because your story is beyond elections and nominations. Your story is a vow and a covenant where you told the Lord that because of what you have done for me, there will be no day and no hour when you will call upon me and I will not be available. So I, I, I still want to make that offer to you that perhaps the reason why in our churches it's so difficult to get people to commit, to get people to work for God, to get people to dedicate themselves, is merely because people haven't found their story yet. I'm not saying they don't believe. Ah, don't, don't, don't confuse it. They believe in Jesus. One believe, can believe in Jesus as a matter of faith, I believe. And then there is belief that on top of it has an experience of a deliverance. When you not only believe because the sermons touched your soul, but you believe because you once faced the end of life face to face and Jesus came through. That's the kind of experience that makes people break alabaster boxes. 
because they've got a story to tell. And no one can ever know that story except those who have their own stories, who are breaking their own alabasters for the service of God. So sometimes when we look at people zealous for God's work and we are quick to say, oh, this one likes attention. Oh, this one likes being at the center. Oh, this one just wants to be praised. Oh, this one likes being thanked. Sometimes you need to pause and ask, what's the story that got them here? Where did Jesus find them? Where they made him a vow that they will always serve him in season or out of season. And that's why I'm saying to you, we all have an alabaster box. If yours is not broken yet, it's because your experience has not come. You may know Jesus and believe, and that is a good thing. And you may be having a relationship with him. But the alabaster box is not broken by the sermon. The alabaster box we break when we have a testimony. That testimony, that's where giving God everything becomes natural and automatic. All right? Then Judas betrays him. As a matter of interest, by the way, for those of you who've got um, 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 Netflix, I would like you to go into your Netflix and search for a series uh, called the Jesus Code. Brilliant work. You know me by now. I am not one who believes that you should read and listen to people because you agree with them. I believe in reading and listening for growth and development and knowing some of the things that are out there and how you can respond to them when you hear them. Because your children will see it. Your, your children will read about it. And they'll ask you questions. And you will be proven as an unreading, unprepared parent when the child begins to ask quite directed questions. There's a beautiful series, though, um, uh, called The Jesus Code, which is on Netflix. I think it's got about six episodes. If you ever get a chance, please watch it. Brilliant, brilliant work. A collection of research done by many different scholars in different fields of biblical studies, from archaeology to linguistics to theology, hermeneutics, you name it. And they are going through the ministry and the life of Jesus. And they are doing this while also studying the Israelite society um, of that time. I mention this because there is, those of you who may, may not be aware, but there is and has been for a while now, the Gospel of Judas, a document that was found in Egypt, which purports to be the Gospel of Judas. It would be interesting to hear those professors, you must hear them discuss the Gospel of Judas, analyzing it linguistically, and what it purports to be his reason for betraying Jesus. But of course, it has also been scientifically proven that that gospel itself was not written by Judas. Though it calls itself the gospel of Judas, it was actually written somewhere around 300 years after the disciples had died, okay? So we know that it's not his original work, but it's interesting to read that document and see how already as early as then, there were really difficulties in understanding where to place G Judas. Is Judas a betrayer? How do you betray someone who was already preparing to die? And I'm, I'm, I'm going to um, give you an example of what we are talking about. In verse 24, uh, Matthew 26, verse 24, the son of man indeed goes just as it is written of him. 
but woe to that man to whom the son of man is betrayed, by whom the son of man is betrayed. It would have been good for that man if he had not been born. So Jesus, first line, the son of man indeed goes just as it is written of him. So Jesus says, I am going to die. I will be crucified as it is written. So me being crucified is not going to change. And then he says, but what to you who betrays me? What to you, you would wish you were not born. And then the question is, but how do I betray someone who is already dying? Someone who already knows that they are going to die. And I suppose really at its simplest, Jesus was merely saying, those whom the devil has filled are ready to kill me and they do not need your assistance. So Judas, I will still be crucified even without you because those who work for the enemy have already determined that I should die. I am now saying to you, Judas, don't let the devil drag you into this as well. He already has people who have been willing to work with him. Do not be part of it. I've been your teacher, I've been your rabbi, and I am your savior. You can still walk away. But if you don't, then woe to you for betraying me. So Jesus was very clear, his death is unnegotiable. For salvation to happen, it must happen. Not that uh, uh, Jesus is orchestrating it, but it will happen as already history has predicted it. It is not preventable. He is going to be killed. All that Jesus was saying to Judas is, don't be part of those who have already made peace with working with an evil side. So Judas betrayed him for 30 pieces um, of silver. Lastly, the Lord's Supper. John in chapter 13 helps us to understand that first they had the feast of the Jews, okay? The normal Passover feast which has unleavened bread and which has the roasted lamb. When they were done, then Jesus gave them the new meal because he was leading them through a journey. This is what Passover used to mean. This is what you were celebrating, your liberation from Egypt to Canaan land. The, 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 the dry lamb which, whose blood is the reason why you were passed over. The, 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 the unleavened bread as well. Now Jesus says, but let's eat that meal. But now I am taking you to its truest meaning when he now gets into the Lord's Supper. And in the Lord's Supper, he now says to, to them, now we do what it all truly means. I am the roasted lamb. The blood that was on the doors is now the blood that will cleanse you from sin at Calvary. And when you believe in me, that blood will cover you and the judgment of God for sin shall now pass you over. I am also the bread, the unleavened bread. Because the living represents sin. And I am the bread that has not been tainted by sin. When you eat me, you are eating the bread that is untainted. We know from John chapter 13. Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come, that he should depart from this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, and he loved them to the end, and Sapa being ended, that Sapa, the, the Jewish Sapa of that evening, the Passover meal, then Jesus instituted the Lord's Sapa, 
starting with the washing of the feet and then moving on to uh, 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 the, the, the drinking of the wine and the eating of the bread. So that evening they did both as a bridge. He was leading them into the new thing. And of course, with the tearing of the, the curtain in the temple when he was dying, it did confirm that indeed there is no more need for the sanctuary services. The true lamb has died. The true lamb has been sacrificed. And the holiest bread the unleavened bread has now been presented before God without sin, without spot, without blemish. Now Jesus says, when you drink this wine, a symbol of that blood that causes judgment to pass over. When you eat this bread, a symbol of the holiness that shall be imparted to you that you may no longer be seen for your sinner self, but that God may see you as he sees me, untainted by sin. This is your new prayer. The challenge with Holy Communion is that, again, between our churches and the Catholic Church, there's still a debate. The Catholics say the bread they eat, the wine they eat, those are the real, real, real body and blood of Jesus. That when you pray for them, they change. We believe that Jesus was clear. These things are substitutes till that day we meet him in heaven and eat it anew. We don't know what anew will mean, but surely it suggests it will not be the same because he will now be there. This was instituted in remembrance of him. The Catholic position is the reason why Christianity has suffered in many countries because then Christians were called cannibalists. That they drink human blood and eat human flesh because of the misunderstanding of Holy Communion. And in many countries, Christianity was banned for decades because it was seen as a cult that eats dead bodies and drinks human blood. In fact, when you read the history of Christianity, in many countries, Christians were blamed whenever there was a human being that went missing because Christians were then seen as this religion that hunts people so that it may have blood and flesh for its Passover days. We don't do that. These are symbols for remembrance. They are not the flesh and the blood. They are symbols of what we do in remembrance of Jesus Christ. And of course, this remembrance we will deal with quite a lot when we get to the crucifixion itself. What exactly are we remembering Jesus for? Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the time we've spent in your presence. May your Holy Spirit always enlighten us and teach us. May everything we do and say be to bring glory and honor to your name and not to our names. May we grow in the knowledge of you and in the love of your word. Bless us with the wisdom to not only be zealous to read your word, but also to understand what it means. Bless us with the power to implement it in our lives so that we may be transformed. Father, in the name of Jesus, this evening, I pray for each and everyone who is represented in this group together with our families. The prayer requests that are sent in the beginning, I also join them in lifting them up to your holy throne and pleading for your mercy and intervention in those situations where we need you the most. We pray, Heavenly Father, that we may never be short of your presence in our homes, that in times of difficulty may our faith grow rather than to die, that in times when we do not understand, may you use that as an opportunity to glorify yourself. 
that in times when we feel alone and abandoned, let us clearly know and feel that you are there. We pray for your indwelling Holy Spirit to guide us and our thoughts. Cause every word that comes out of our mouth to be a testimony to your presence in us. May we never betray you in anything that we do. And should we find ourselves cornered by evil and betraying you, teach us to not run away and hide, but to trust you with confession and prayer that we may be forgiven and reconciled with you. We pray for the humility that leads us to confess when we have done wrong. We pray that you help us to reject pride that causes to want to defend ourselves rather than to confess. This we pray together with the confession of our sins through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And let all who believe say, Amen.